Hey, Westgate family, welcome to Westgate Church Online. Hey, Lisa. Hey, David, how are you? Good. It's good to see you, and it's great to be with you guys today. It's so good to be together in worship and around God's Word. And if you're coming off of a long week or you're anticipating the week ahead, we pray that this experience today would be one that just infuses you with real hope. Hey, Lisa, by the way, have you ever had to do the COVID walk of shame? The COVID walk of shame. Uh, I don't know what that is. That's when you walk into store and you just realize that you forgot your mask and you have to walk all the way back and everyone's giving you the stank eye. Yep, on a regular basis I experienced that. Mm -hmm. Well, the masks have become the new fuzzy dice on car mirrors. Ooh, that's a good one. Well, you know what I do to prevent that? I have masks everywhere around my house. And you know the most creative place that there's masks? Where? Mark puts them inside of his hat, so he always has one no matter where he goes. Amazing. Yep. Before we kick off our time together, we just want to remind you that if you're having a hard time watching this during the normal times, we have everything recorded for you at your convenience by Sunday afternoon for you to watch. And we are so excited to announce that our Kids Town services are now online. Parents, we know it's been tough to try to engage your kids in online church. So our children's department has worked really hard to put together a weekly production just for them. Not only is it fun, but it's engaging. And best of all, it's centered around God's word in an age appropriate way. That's right. I can't wait for my girls to watch it. All you need to do is to check out our Kids Town page on our website, and it is posted every Saturday for you to watch at any time. And just a reminder, if you're watching with us today and you're in need of prayer, we have pastors that are available that would love the opportunity to pray with you. Just click the button on your screen. As we come to worship today, Psalm 84 says this, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. And it goes on to say, better is one day in your presence than a thousand elsewhere. So together, let's experience God's presence now.
I'd still be wandering if not for love I'd be alone if not for Jesus I'd be a debtor if not for pardon I'd be a slave if not for freedom I'd be a prisoner he has come Jesus, that there is any hope for this world or the world to come. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not, can not, will not overcome it. Jesus says, do not lose heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the darkness. Jesus, we ask you to come now and to permeate the darkness that we see in the world around us. Lord, so much darkness, the darkness we see within ourselves. God, come with your light now. We ask for, for your victorious light 
to come, that you would have your way, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would become in this earth, in our hearts, in our minds, as it is in heaven. Your name is alive, forever lifted high, and your name. 
says that anyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, in your living room, in your car, would you just call out on the name of Jesus right now? Wherever you need him to come and to intervene, wherever you need him to come and rescue you, will you call out on the name of Jesus? It might not be in the way you thought. It might not be in the timing that you thought. But he promises that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. So Jesus, we call on your name. We are desperate for you. We cannot rescue ourselves. And we need you to come. Thank you for your promise that you overcome the darkness, that your light cannot be overcome. And so in these dark times, may your light shine ever brighter still, we pray in your powerful name. recently came across a very good book. It's called Beautiful Resistance by John Tyson. And in that book, he tells a story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a 20th century German theologian that we know most about because of his stand against Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party uh, in Germany in the 30s. And the story is told that Bonhoeffer is challenged um, to begin to take some of the ways that he's following after Christ and open up a seminary. And so he does. He opens a seminary in 1935. And while he's doing that, um, many of the German, uh, German folks at that time are sitting by watching these Nazi-supported political parties um, begin to influence and infiltrate the church. And they actually came in and began to change uh, church policy they tried to exclude non-Aryan uh, clergy. They tried to revise the liturgy to make it more German-friendly. They even tried to get rid of all of the Old Testament and take it out of the scriptures. And in, in opposition to this movement, um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer's seminary got the reputation of being very conservative and very strict in some of its, um, its requirements to actually live out the Christian life um, in, in the culture that they were in. And much of this is, is included in two of his great works. If you've never read either work by Life T Together or The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he talks about some of the ways that this seminary began to interpret and um, live out the life of Christ. Well, the story is told that um, as his reputation began to kind of get out around Germany, um, that one of his friends, uh, Wilhelm Niesel, um, came to him and said, Dietrich, man, you're, I think you guys are getting a little too serious about this. And he, he used the phrase, there's so much spiritualism going on inside of this seminary that we're a little confused for, and, and uh, concerned for you. And um, it's, the story is told that um, Bonhoeffer takes Niesel and puts him in a boat and they row actually up the Oder River. And he, they row up the river for a while just outside of uh, Finkenwald. And then they get up on, a, on the bank of that river and they climb up on a small hill and they get up on the hill. And as they get up on the hill, they can see across the river, they can see a, a German um, air base um, where the uh, Third Reich, the German soldiers, are training and uh, preparing for what would eventually be World War II. And he looks on, down at them and he says, look, uh, my friend, look at how diligently they train. Look at how they're training down there. And he, he does. And uh, then he's, 
let me let, me let, let, me let Charles Marsh, a biographer of uh, Bonhoeffer, he says it this way. When the two rowers reached the far shore, Bonhoeffer led Niesel up a small hill to a clearing from which they could see in the distance a vast field and the runways of a nearby squadron. German fighter planes were taking off and landing and soldiers moved hurriedly in purposeful manners like so many little ants. Bonhoeffer spoke of a new generation of Germans in training whose disciplines were formed for a kingdom of hardness and cruelty. Bonhoeffer goes on to say, it would be necessary, he explained, to, uh, to propose a, a superior discipline if the Nazis were going to be defeated. And this is what he said. He said, you have to be stronger than these tormentors that you find everywhere today. You have to be stronger than that. So who won? I mean, the, the question on, at face value is almost ridiculous. Hitler goes on to uh, lead the German army into World War II, and Bonhoeffer is right after this. He, he's arrested um, and eventually killed. Um, soon after this, um, the famous Crystal Knight of November of 38, where 7,500 Jewish shops are closed and people are, and Jewish owners are put in jail. 400 synagogues in Germany are all destroyed and burnt down. This is the beginning of the Holocaust, where a systematic elimination of over six million Jews um, takes place yeah, under German regimes. But you fast forward almost 90 years later, who won? Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a global hero. His writings have changed the church and challenge, his challenges to Christendom have changed millions of lives. Millions, literally millions of lives. The German church has repented, and recognized their wrong. Germany has paid billions of dollars in reparations to Israel and for their crimes in World War II. And there's genuine shame and sorrow in Germany for their part in World War II. Who won? Well, Hitler's long gone and dead, although some of his thoughts are still alive and well. But it's easy to see that the, the influence big picture was this stronger than in an effort to follow after Christ. I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that our culture and the way that it is squeezing in on what it means to be a Christ follower, that loving our neighbor is more difficult than ever before. I know that's a pretty radical statement that usually preachers make, but I, I just have looked back over past messages of loving our neighbor. We've talked about this for over 15 years, and I've looked back on, on the different challenges, and certainly there have been and will remain some challenges, but it seems like we have some new ones that are pressing in and squeezing out a love for our neighbor. And our discipleship, our commitment to it must be stronger. Now, if you think I'm getting ready to talk about regathering, that is not what I'm talking about. Regathering is easy. It's how do you walk with the desires and the pressures to love your neighbor against the desires and the pressures to gather together. If we didn't worry about loving our neighbor and being sensitive to some of the uh, relationships that we have with the county and the city and how we'd be viewed by people who aren't in our church, regathering is easy. That's the easy button. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about balancing the convictions of following Christ as Lord in a culture that is basically filled with contempt and suspicion and hate. How do we carry on and not be seen as short-sighted and selfish and even reckless to those outside the church? Well, it's in that culture that we have this command. And Jesus' challenge to us has not, challenged, has not changed. And in Luke 10, we still face the same command. He tells a story about a, a man who is walking on a road coming out of Jerusalem and he is attacked by robbers and beaten up and left on the side of the road. Religious leaders walk by and ignore the man, mostly because the man is different 
And then a Samaritan comes along. And as it says in Luke 10, verse 33, that as he traveled, he came to Merit where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil on and wine on his, on his uh, injuries and put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn, took care of him. It goes on to say that this is the, this is the example for us, someone who would cross over racial divides and economic divides and, and step into the mess of life, that we are to love our neighbor this way. We want to ask who's our neighbor and limit the thing. And Jesus says, no, go and be a good neighbor. But what keeps us from loving our neighbor today? What are the new challenges that I speak of? And how can we overcome them? Well, I think in this culture of hate and contempt and can cancel culture that, that we are operating in, we, we have to have a stronger biblical foundation to enter into some of the discussions that are going on. And so I want to encourage you in three areas um, that you would um, begin to lean into some of the things that I'll mention. Now lean in with me because this is, this is deep waters. The first is we need a solid biblical anthropology. Now don't, don't freak out here. Um, that, that's a combination of Greek words, anthropos, which means mankind, and logos, which means to study. So it's just simply that word means a study of mankind. And we need a biblical understanding of mankind. Well, what is that narrative? And let me help you with that narrative as you look at the scriptures. The Bible consistently teaches us that, the, that mankind is, is, there is a unity of race and equality before God, created in the image of God, having a relationship to God that is personal and not mechanical, and that God has extended his promises and his covenants to all of mankind that we are created for this kind of community and relating to one another. We are, exist in this unity of one another. We have way more in common with every person we meet than we have in differences, regardless of where they are socioeconomically, racially, politically. The biblical narrative goes on to say that there's a quality to mankind, that because we're created in God, we have what is called bestowed worth. We are loved by God, and we are therefore um, have value, and that every single life has value from the womb to the tomb. The unborn and the aged all have value in this understanding of anthropology that the Bible gives us. It goes on to say that mankind is, exists in a fallen state. In other words, we are sinful. And beginning from the first man and woman and, and every person since, that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory and standard, and that the penalty of that sin uh, before God is separation from Him. We also know that that the biblical narrative tells us that salvation is offered to all people and all mankind can experience forgiveness and reconciliation to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 5 said it this way, For if by the trespass of one man death re reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And the teachings of that forgiveness is that we are all equal before Christ. We need to understand these, that we are unified as a race, that there's a quality because of God's love and created in God's image, that all of mankind exists in a state of fallenness, but that God has intervened on our behalf and offers forgiveness and salvation in spite of our sin. And that in Christ, all are equal. There are no divisions whether it be of race or gender or ethnicity or, or economics or anything, there's no, there's no divisions left because of what Christ has done. And this story is consistent even with the most casual reading of the scriptures from the very first pages to the very end. The second thing I think that we need to understand is that the gospel offers reconciliation and restoration. That there is there is. Uh, based on the gospel and the grace of God, there is reconciliation offered. 
2 Corinthians 5 says it this way, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to us this message of reconciliation. So we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, be reconciled to God. The gospel is about forgiveness and reconciliation. It's not about power. That's what's lacking in the narrative that we hear and that's going on in our culture today. It's all about the transference of power. Take power away from one group and give it to another group, but that does not allow for any opportunity for reconciliation. We have to be better than that. We have to be stronger than that. And we have to be able to be champions of reconciliation. It was said that forgiveness is the only way to reverse the irreversible flow of history. And that's what Jesus proclaimed when he said from the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. We've got to be champions of this reconciliation. Not only understand anthropology and what the Bible says about us as mankind, but be also champions of reconciliation. And then finally, under, have a clear understanding of what biblical justice is and not allow the narratives of the day to be able to describe what is fair or what is right. Here's, here's some, I borrowed from Tim Keller who wrote um, an article lately about biblical justice. And it, he says that it's, it's really several things. It's recognizing that we're part of community that others actually have a claim on our wealth, and so I must share what I have. I, I exist in community, and Matthew 5 through 7 in Jesus' most famous sermon, he says that we have got to be others-centered and be able to demonstrate that other-centeredness with the sharing of our resources. We also see that it's not only based on community, but it's based on equity. Jesus systematically destroys all of the understandings that happened before him that said that some groups are more important than others. Let me just take you through the list of all of the folks that didn't have value in the first century that Jesus gave value to. Children who were just property. Matthew 19, he says, not only are they important, but actually to enter into the kingdom of God, we need to become a child. Not a child needs to become an adult. The sick who were obviously had God's hand against them. In Luke 14, he says, that is not the way to view it, that God is actually for them. Women in the first century who were seen as, as, as just property to be managed and owned, John 4, Jesus gives value and honor to them. The differences of race and ethnicity in Luke 10, the story I just referred to, or the Good Samaritan, or where he just demolishes all those divisions. And then as if, as if he has, in case he, just in case he left anything out, he says, the least of these. So any group you can imagine that's un, that seems to be without favor and marginalized and under-resourced, he says in Matthew 25 that when we show compassion to them, they, we are showing it to him. He gives value and honor to those and that there's an equity in, in our lives. Not only that is there community and equity, but there's a corporate responsibility that over and over again, um, Christians are encouraged and commanded to, to be aware of what is going on in the, co in the corporate uh, community and be responsible for them, that we can't just turn our eyes away from people that we disagree with or don't get along with. And sometimes God... Um, we'll choose to hold families and communities responsible for something that's going on in their world if, they, if you choose to ignore it, that we've got to recognize that we, are, we have a corporate responsibility, but of course we also have an individual responsibility that I'm, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for all of my sin and yet not my outcomes, but all of the sin that I commit, I'm responsible for that. And so as we talk about what it looks like to have this biblical justice, we've got to recognize that there's an in, not a corporate responsibility and an individual responsibility. And then finally, Tim Keller goes on to say that there also has to be this component of advocacy, that we must have special concern for the poor and the marginalized in our lives, that, that, that the idea of, of justice would involve an advocacy 
while we don't show partiality um, to any particular group, we certainly will look out for those who are under-resourced and less privileged. What would this look like today? I hope you're still tracking with me and, and that um, as you ask this question, what would this really look like today? Let me try to get um, specific. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing from John Tyson's book, The Beautiful Resistance, as he has some of this um, in his book, even much more if you'd like to read it. But I've got four things that I believe it's going to look like today. Number one is that it's going to be a, some people who bring honor in culture, in a culture of contempt. That we, that we honor all people. Contempt is the feeling that someone is beneath consideration. And we need to learn to, that, to see value in each and every person. Romans 12 says, be devoted to one another uh, in love. Honor one another above ourselves. We must be able to recognize that, the, that there, we, we can't just say, have some sophomoric understanding about how things are going and, and remove honor from people that need it. I mean, it's clear to recognize that an example of this would be, it's clear to recognize that, that there are police forces that have bad police um, in their force and that we have seen horrible um, illustrations of this. But to just eliminate and, and, and cast dispurging remarks and attitudes towards the whole police force when they're filled with mostly good people who want to serve us. To recognize that there are some police problems, but mostly um, it's filled with a group of folks that really deserve our honor and that they are honorable servants of the public and that we could do that and hold them in high regard. So honor in a culture of contempt. Agape love in a cancel culture. And the cancel culture just says, I want, they want to eliminate you. They, want to, they disagree with you. They don't want to have discussions. They don't want to have any kind of talk. They just want to eliminate you. It's way harder to work through disagreements when no one will talk. Henry Nouwen said, love is stronger than fear. Life is stronger than death and hope is stronger than despair. We have to trust that the risk of loving is always worth taking. We have to have agape love, God-centered love in this cancel culture. And we can only do this with Jesus' hope. We, we, we don't, we're not able to do this really in and of ourselves. We have got to rely on the help of Christ to, to help us to love the people around us. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. So as, you, as you're challenged with this, you, you express this agape love, God's Spirit will come along and help you and give you actually the joy and the resources you need to be able to interact with folks this way. Not only honor and culture of a contempt and agape love, love and a cancel culture, but celebration in a culture of cynicism. I was on a phone call this past week and we had five county and city officials along with about 30 pastors and we were informed, we've been in dialogue for several weeks, trying to work through some of the restrictions that are going on. And basically what we've said is we'll, we'll meet outdoors for a while so that we can, we can get our numbers where the county wants them to be, but we need to be able to sing. And they weren't moving on that for a while, but this past week when we met, the county let us know that when we gather now outdoors, we can, we can sing and, and every church can, when they meet together, can sing and have um, responsive readings and those kinds of things. And at the end of the meeting, a pastor that um, was a part of this when the city officials were all gone, this pastor said, four weeks ago, I was totally cynical about the restrictions that the city and the county were placing on us and that the supervisors weren't gonna work with us at all. And then he said, today I am filled with optimism that we can work together and do it in a way that honors the way of Jesus and the people that are uh, leading us in our county that we can, we can have this celebration of life and, and honor and love when everybody is so cynical about what's going on. You cannot lose your hope in this. God promises that he'll fill us with it. So we've got honor and love and celebration. And then finally, what it would look like today is continuing to be, have hospitality 
in a culture of isolation and fear. Now, this one's tricky. You don't want you to do it in a reckless way, but in a way that's sensitive to people's um, you know, desires and things. And some, it's going to mean that life groups are going to just stay um, focused on Zoom calls and other life groups, they'll meet each week outside. And, and I don't know how that'll all play out, but it, there's got to be this. But if you've got honor and you've got love and you've got celebration as the motives that go, you're going to figure out how to be hospitable to folks that are around us. And it's more difficult now than ever because this, these restrictions of COVID are isolating us. And now it's been going on for many months. And so there's habits formed and things that we're going to have to break through. Jesus just commands us that we've got to continue to exercise this. We're going to, we're going to have, as life groups get going, we're going to have a great opportunity to do it there. As a beautiful day comes in October, we're going to have great opportunity to do it there. And then trust me, men and women, trust me, our numbers are moving in a favorable way. The county has assured me that we're going to be dropped levels and we're going to be able to gather soon. But until that time, we've got to be champions of these kinds of things. I mean, the truth is, is as you and I live through this the coming week, we've got the challenges of COVID. We have to be stronger than that. The continuing um, results of the fires and the weird skies and the damage and loss of property, we have to be stronger than that the riots and the things that are still continuing on. We have to be stronger than that. And then the elections that are coming up, fellow Christ followers, we have to be stronger. We have to be people that choose love over hate, that choose honor over contempt, that we will continually challenge one another to live lives of honor and love and celebration and hospitality. Let's pray together. Father, the task is just too much for us. And yet you have said to us very clearly that if, if we hate our brother and our sister, we do not love you. And so we ask God that you would help us to be people who are willing to love our neighbors well, that are willing to cross the street, that are willing to cross the aisle, that are willing to even dialogue with people who disagree with us in every single way, that you'll help us to be people of love. God, this is, this is difficult waters for us to navigate. We need your help. May we, as a community, more than ever, because of our deep love for you and the work of Christ and the grace that's been poured into our lives because we have been so well loved, God, may we go and love well. In Jesus' name, amen.
I love his invitation to bring our doubts and our fears to him, that he welcomes us just the way we are. When we make that declaration that he is the way, we're also saying that he is our first priority. So as we continue in our worship, if your desire is to make him your first priority, one of the ways we can do that is by giving financially. All of the information on giving is below on your screen, but at this time, let us practice generosity. Would you pray with us? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. God, may we live that out in our community around us, that many would come to know of your love. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give back from the first that you've given us. Thank you for how generous you are with us. May we be that at Westgate so that our world and our city can be changed because of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've joked earlier about how COVID has changed so many things for us. Even here at Westgate, some things have changed uh, with outside services and baptisms. But one thing that hasn't changed is beautiful day, which is one of the huge ways which we show love to our neighbors. Check this out. You know, every year for the past 12 years, Westgate Church has done something called Beautiful Day. Beautiful Day is the time of year where we shut down services. Instead of doing services inside, we take church outside and serve the surrounding community at a variety of service projects. This year, we were planning on doing Beautiful Day in the spring, but then COVID hit. COVID, you're not beautiful, nor are you a day. There's nothing beautiful about you, and it's more like a terrible two-thirds of a year. So go home, nobody likes you. The point is, we had to reschedule Beautiful Day, and this year, it's in the middle of October, on October 17th and 18th, with a prep weekend on October 10th. We're very excited about this, because this means that Beautiful Day is back. Now, I know what you're asking yourself. You're asking yourself a number of questions. First of all, is it really worth it to purchase Mulan on Disney Plus? Is it, Luke? Nobody knows. You also might be wondering, what are you doing with a prop shovel? But the third question, the most valid one you might be asking yourself is, how are we gonna make Beautiful Day projects safe for everybody? And the answer is like this, with this broom. First of all, we're gonna be socially distanced. Keep going, keep going, keep going, Luke, keep going. We're gonna be socially distant. We're gonna make sure that everyone RSVPs. We're gonna make sure that everything is taken care of to, 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 to make sure that we actually adhere to the county's health protocols. And in addition to that, every single project is gonna be outside and all the tools are gonna to be properly disinfected. COVID doesn't stand a chance. The point is we've done everything we can to make this year's beautiful day as good as possible and as effective as possible. So sign up today. Again, beautiful day is gonna be on October 17th and 18th with a prep weekend on October 10th. There's 21 different projects, sign up today. This is a great way to get your kids out of the house. It's a great way to get you out of the house. And it's a great way, even more importantly, for us to serve together as a church, to show the world we're not just interested in Jesus, but we take him seriously when he says to love our neighbors. So bring your hand sanitizer, sign up, and look for those registration links in about a week and sign up for Beautiful Day. COVID, you don't stand a chance. Make sure to circle those dates on your calendar and RSVP as well. So that wraps it up for us here today. And remember, the service isn't the main event. It's how we live out our faith all week long. Let's listen to Steve as he sends us out with a closing blessing. Hey, just a couple of things before we go. First, uh, as we are entering into the fall, the very best way to figure out what your, what your next step might be is just to simply to go to our website and right there up on the top, kind of the right corner up there, up towards the right, a little bit top, you will see next steps. And if you'll click there, then if you're new to us, you can, go, you can find out what your first steps can be. If you've here, been here a while, then the next steps will lay themselves out. And if you've been here a, a real long while, then there's even some further steps for you there. That's the, the one-stop shop uh, to know what's next for you. We've tried to make it as simple as we can. If, uh, if you will go there and do that, I think you'll find the information. If you don't, you can just give us a call or, or send us an email and we would be glad to let you know um, what we think the next step should be for you. A reminder too that we've got some positions of our hands that as we go through our love God, love your neighbor and love one another, that love God of surrender, the love neighbor of generosity and the love one another of, of community, that love God, love your neighbor, love one another. We continue to call ourselves 
and work ourselves to that. And how it's gonna express itself right now is we're calling the rally cry. And so rally stands for R is respond globally. And I had the chance to tell you next week, last week, it's been such a great year. We were able to give away tons and tons of money this past year because of your generosity. And we are determined that in this COVID season, we are not gonna back off a bit in terms of our commitments to what's going on around the world. And so respond globally is R. A is acquire Jack in the Box. Now there's some confusion about that because actually it's not acquire Jack in the Box, it's pay for Jack in the Box. We've already acquired it. We had a congregational vote last fall and determined that we, that we should seize this opportunity and grab that, that uh, lot because it was available. What we're gonna do with it exactly is not completely clear to us. We needed it for parking. We know at least for parking because Cato lot is going away. We're losing the Cato parking. And so acquire Jack in the Box, we've already voted to acquire it. This is to get it paid for. And I'm encouraging you, if you can, no pressure if you're under some financial pressure right now because of COVID or other things, but if you're not and you can, please between now and the end of this year, let's get it paid off by the end of uh, 2020. We've got a matching fund of a million dollars. If we can match that, we'll get it paid off and that'll be there. You can, you can find all of that in the Rally Match Fund that's on the drop-down menu in the, in the giving box. The first L is for love one another by um, controlling our, our, our spending uh, that's going on in terms of our operational costs so that we can do that. And then that allows us, we think, to position us in a very uh, strategic way to see what's gonna be the fallout of this. We are anticipating and are hearing from some of the smaller churches in our city that they're in trouble and we wanna be agents of really being able to help them stay open and not to close and also to be able to help people in our community who have had a hard time through this time. So love one another by controlling our costs. This, the next L is live out 640 life. This is our mission, it's so clear. And you, I've already mentioned, go to those the homepage there and go to next step and find out what your next step will be in the 640 life, whether it's getting interested in it and finding some information or finally getting in a life group. And then finally, the why is for a commitment to youth and kids and um, this past week, our new high school guy for the Saratoga campus just came into town, moved in, and so we've got him coming. Cody, you'll get a chance to meet him soon. And the rally then stands for, remember, um, respond globally, acquire the Jack in the Box, which is really just get it paid for, love one another, um, live out 640 life, and then our youth and kids. Now, I wanna lead you through a prayer, and I'd like for you to challenge you just to slow down a little bit um, I know we're almost done, but just slow down a little bit before you run off and lead you through a prayer um, at this time. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. So that you can do what others claim cannot be done. to bring justice and kindness to all our children. 